Hello, I am Maxime Torson and this video is the presentation for AG Group 2021 paper on lattice-based group signatures. So this is joint work with Vadim Lubeshevsky, Khan and Guyen and Gregor Zeiler. Uh, okay, so now just a quick overview of what the paper is. So in 2018, there was a lattice-based group signature construction that was proposed, but since then there's been quite a bit of improvement in lattice-based zero noise proofs. So some contributions on uh, efficiency, new techniques, and um, some uh, about the statements that can be proven. So this paper uses these uh, recent results to improve upon the 2018 construction. Um, okay. So now about the structure of the video. So first I'll introduce some technical background necessary for exposition. Uh, next, I'll define a high level uh, from high level the previous construction from 2018, and then I'll give a list of the improvements we make upon it. Okay, so first, uh, BDLB lattice based commitment scheme. So if you want to read, there's uh, notations on the slides. So how does the BDLP lattice based commitment scheme work? So to s the setup is you sampling a uniformly random matrix A0. And then for every message you want to commit to, so a message is uh, an element of our queue, you will uh, sample a uniformly random vector uh, a, a1 to a alpha from our queue. So now to commit to uh, these messages, what you do is you sample a short vector r, so a vector with short coefficients r, and the commitment is going to be this uh, big matrix um, here times r plus uh, zero and then the messages. So the commitment is made of two parts, the top part, which is A0R, and then um, for every message you will send A transpose R plus this message. Okay, so now next slide is just um, uh, say a reminder to make sure we're all on the same page about this. So again, you have notations, you can pause the video if you want to read. And now the idea here is that to prove knowledge of the message in a BDLOP commitment, what you do is give a zero knowledge proof of knowledge of the short randomness R that was uh, used during the commitment. So if you remember from the previous slide. Okay, so I move on to a short list of the um, uh, statements that can be proven on BDLP commitments. So first, you can prove a linear relations. So say you have commitment to M1 and M2. Um, then you can prove that m1 equals lambda m2 for some lambda in RQ uh, for very cheap. Now, <clears throat> second one is a product relation. So say you have commitment to m1, m2, and m3. Then you can prove that m1 equals m2 times m3 for pretty cheap. Um, and finally, you can prove unstructured linear relations, so-called unstructured, because uh, here you prove that qm1 equals m2 where QM1, Q is a matrix over ZQ, so you kind of forget about the RQ structure of M1 and you just consider it as a list of coefficients, and M2 as well. Uh, okay, so this also can be proven for pretty cheap. Um, and uh, yeah, these statements will be uh, useful uh, later. Okay, so now I move to the second uh, part of the, of the technical background. Uh, part of the video. So what a group signature is. So in a group signature you have three entities. You have the setup authority, the group manager, which will be called the opener sometimes, and some group members, which will be called uh, users or signers. So every uh, group member has an identity i in a set cartographic i. And uh, so what the setup authority will do is first uh, generate a public key for the whole group and the open a secret key. And once this is done, for every um, for every identity in calligraphic I, so every user pretty much, the uh, setup authority will generate a signing key SI. So when this is done, uh, the setup authority will give uh, the group manager his opener key and every group member of identity I will receive the signing key SI. Uh, okay, so now what we want is that uh, some user with identity i should be able to produce a signature sigma of some message m that is valid under the public key of the whole group. So uh, a signer should sign on behalf of the whole group and this kind of implies, so what we, what we also want 
is that this signature doesn't give away his uh, identity. So he should sign on behalf of the whole group and we shouldn't know who, who the signer is apart from the fact that he belongs to the group. And this uh, brings me to the fourth uh, item, which is uh, that the group manager should be able to open the, the signature and find out the identity of the signer. So the group manager should be the, uh, the only one able to do this. Okay, so I move on to uh, the secret security properties of a lattice based, oh, of a group signature, sorry. So first we have anonymity, which I kind of just mentioned, but I'll uh, uh, explain it again. So the intuition is a signature should not leak the identity of the signer. Uh, and so more formally what this means is that if, if the adversary knows all the signing keys, then he should not be able to distinguish between the signatures produced by any two users. Uh, okay, so now the second one is traceability, uh, which is kind of the equivalent of unforgeability for group signatures. So if the adversary has uh, some signing keys in a set S, <coughs> sorry, uh, and the opener secret key, then what we want is that the adversary is not able to create a valid signature that doesn't such that the opener, when the opener decrypts the identity from the signature, he, sh he should uh, find uh, an identity that the adversary possesses. Um, okay, so the reason why this is uh, the equivalent of um, unforgeability for uh, group signatures is, for example, if you take S to be the empty set, so the adversary doesn't have any signing keys, uh, he just has the opener secret key, then we the, this traceability property translates into the adversary should not be able to produce a valid signature at all. Uh, okay, so now I will move on to um, uh, the second part of the video, which is defining uh, the 2018 lattice-based group signature construction. Okay, so let's take it slow. We have a set of identities calligraphic I that is made of uh, RQ elements that are stable under some uh, two automorphisms. Um, so the setup algorithm goes as follows. So first you generate an MLW instance. So you have, uh, you sample uniformly random A, short trapdoor R, and you set B equals AR. Now, next what you do is you sample uh, S1, S2 from a Gaussian, and you let uh, U to be AS1 plus BS2. And so the public key is going to be A, B, and this uh, U. So now to some, so if you have some uh, user with identity I, you want to sample his signing key. What you do is you sample S1, I, and S2, I from a Gaussian under the condition that um, th this equation here uh, holds. So the G is a simple matrix that allows the sampling using the, tra the trapdoor R. And you can notice that the identity of the signer here is part of uh, this matrix. Um, okay, and so this is the signing key of a user. And now the last step is to generate a key pair for a verifiable encryption scheme. So every user with identity I will get his signing key S1i, S2i, and the group manager will get the secret key for the verifiable encryption scheme. Okay. <clears throat> so now how does uh, signing go? So let's say we have a user with identity i, so he has the signing key S1i, S2i. So what he will first do to sign a message is um, uh, commit to his identity i with some random r under BDLOP commitment scheme and he will give a uh, zero knowledge proof that his identity is part of calligraphic i. So another contribution of the 2018 paper is a way to prove uh, automorphism stability and so um, yeah this is done by proving that i is stable under the two automorphisms that define calligraphic i and uh, yeah the, the, this is Done. So there's this commitment to prove pi one, and then um, <clears throat> um, the the second part of the of the signature is a proof of knowledge of the secret key 
S1 i, S2 i. So it's the proof of knowledge of a short solution of this equation here. And this is, uh, so in 2018, this couldn't be uh, done directly. And so, uh, yeah, the, the, yeah the, it's ra rather more uh, complicated when, than what we can do today. And so, um, <clears throat> finally, uh, the user will encrypt uh, the randomness R that he used for BDLOP. Um, so you will encrypt it with the group manager's verifiable encryption public key. And uh, yeah, he will also compute a proof by three that the ciphertext is well formed. So, so the verifier knows that the that this encryption so no knows that the um, group manager is able to decrypt uh, this R. So okay, now the signature is made of uh, the commitment F, the ciphertext C, and all uh, three zero knowledge proofs. So the first one is the proof that the identity is an identity. The second one is the proof that um, is the proof of knowledge of the of the secret key, and the third one is the proof of well-formedness of the ciphertext. And so, if the opener wants to um, know the identity of the signer, what he does is uh, use his secret key for the verifiable encryption scheme and decrypt the randomness R in the BDLOP commitment. So, when this is done, he can infer uh, the identity from it. Okay. So now I move on to the last part of the video, which is a list of the improvements we bring on this um, lattice-based group signature. So um, first we extend this scheme to module LWE, which, okay. Uh, second, we give a simpler and more efficient way to prove uh, the knowledge of the secret key for the signature of a user. And third, we give a more efficient membership proof for by one. So we use a different uh, set calligraphy I, and this comes with a different um, zero knowledge proof. Uh, okay. And finally, we um, the encryption almost comes for free. So the and the and the well formedness proof of uh, the ciphertext as well. And so overall, we shrink the size of the signature from. 580 kilobytes to 203 kilobytes. Okay, so now I will give a little more details on items two, three, and four. So item two. So what we need to prove is the knowledge of a short pre-image S1 and S2 from uh, this uh, of this U from for this matrix here. So now the problem is that this matrix A and AR minus IG contains uh, the identity i and this identity i cannot give, cannot be given away because this would break uh, anonymity. So um, this i is committed to, and as I just said in uh, the twenty eighteen construction, this is done. Um, this is done uh, uh, in a way that uh, increases the length of the ring cis solution to be extracted, and this uh, implies. Pr pretty pretty bad uh, parameters. Oh, I mean worse uh, parameters. So um, an idea that could be uh, uh, good is to see that uh, this uh, matrix product contains actually a product proof somehow for PDLOP because I is committed to, and so if you have a commitment to S two, then you could prove uh, this equation here using the the product proof from I I talked about in the introduction. So now there is a problem with this, which is if you commit to S2, then uh, this increases uh, uh, a lot the length of the signature and this is not something you wanna do. So we have a different solution for this, which is uh, as follows. So let's define A prime to be the matrix A and B minus IG. So now what we see is that if a prime was public, then the verification equation would be something like a prime z equals w plus c u. Um, okay, and um, now from the homomorphic properties of BDLOP commitment scheme, we know that the verifier can infer a commitment to a prime. So from the commitment to i, the verifier knows a commitment to this uh, a prime because a, b, and g are public. 
<coughs> so um, our solution to prove uh, knowledge of S1, S2 is to commit to the W instead of sending it in the clear and then the verification equation, which is, I, I remind, um, A prime Z equals W plus CU is linear in the committed messages. So, as I just said, we have a commitment to A prime, we have a commitment to W, and uh, everything else is public. So, this is a relatively cheap BDLP linear proof um, that we prove. So, we prove the verification equation instead of uh, just proving the statement directly. Uh, okay, so this was the second item. Now I move on to the third item. So as I said, we have a different set of identities, calligraphic I. So our set of identities is the uh, integers in our queue um, from 0 to 2 to the d minus 1 minus 1. And now uh, I'll explain what the zero knowledge proof of that I is uh, in calligraphic I. So I'll explain what this zero knowledge proof is. So it goes in two steps. First, we add an extra commitment to IB, which is the inverse entity of the binary representation of I. Um, so once this is done, um, remains two things to prove. So first, we prove that IB is indeed uh, binary. So no, we prove that IB's entity is binary because it's the inverse entity of some binary representation. Um, so this is done using uh, the product proof. You have the equations here if you uh, want to check it. So this is the first step. And now the second step is proving this unstructured linear relation. So um, let's uh, read this slow. So we prove that Q times the entity of IB is equal to the entity of I. So if you remember, IB, so it's still written on the slide, IB is the inverse entity of the binary representation of I. So entity of IB on the left here is uh, the vector that is the binary representation of I. And what we prove is that Q times the binary representation of I is equal to the entity of I. So this contains two statements actually. So first, um, we prove that uh, the entity of i here is made of uh, the same coefficient all the way because this matrix Q has the same uh, rows. So the entity of i is made of uh, only the same coefficients all the way. And this uh, means that i is an integer because, so you, you can uh, check it if you want, the only uh, RQ elements that have um, entity coefficients all the same are integers. So so th this second equation here proves that uh, i is an integer. And finally, since the binary representation uh, only has uh, length d, then this also proves that uh, i is an integer in the range 0 to 2 to the d minus 1. And this is actually a proof that i is in calligraphic i. OK. So now the last part, which is uh, in the explaining uh, the title of the paper, the almost for free uh, encryption. So um, to have this uh, verifiable encryption almost for free, what we do is um, use the commitment as a ciphertext. So to do this, what we do is we add an extra commitment to root Q times I. And so we get a ciphertext uh, that looks like this. So we have uh, F0, F1, F2. And um, the setup authority will plant the decryption key in the, in the public uh, A1 and A2. So it will look like you can, you can uh, check the slides if you are interested in the technical details. So we notice that uh, even though A1 and A2 contain, contains a uh, decryption key, uh, this doesn't change the distribution because under MLWE, uh, this uh, new A1 and A2 are still uh, uniformly random. So this change is uh, secure. And uh, so again, if you wanna if you wanna see how the decryption goes, you can uh, pause the video and read the slides. Um, and so the proof of well-formedness for this ciphertext is just the the same proof as uh, for 
the commitment scheme. So it's sent already. So we prove knowledge of the short r in this equation here. And um, we also prove that um, the second commitment, which is to root q times i, is indeed of uh, root q times i. So this is a BDLOP linear uh, proof, which is very cheap. Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, as I just said, uh, the first item here is proven already because we need to prove that the commitment, uh, that we know the message in the commitment already. And the second one is, as I said, very cheap. So in the end, this verifi verifiable sorry, encryption comes almost for free. Okay. Um, so there's one more uh, problem that we need to uh, address. So um, in uh, in the, the the sound the soundness of the zero knowledge proof for PDLP, which we use as uh, the proof for the well-formedness of the ciphertext, only ensures that there exists a, ch a challenge difference C bar such that uh, this equation holds. And what this means is that even if the proof goes goes uh, is valid, then the verifier is not sure that the decryption is going to be correct. And um, yeah, the, the, this is uh, not something that we want because all we know is that um, it, for, for, for the challenge uh, C that is used in the proof, there exists a C prime such that C minus C prime times F is a valid ciphertext for c bar times i. And um, yeah, so what we do to correct this is um, change a little the decryption algorithm. So instead of decrypting directly f, the opener will uh, sample a challenge c prime, take c bar to be c minus c prime and try and decrypt c bar times f and then divide it by uh, c bar so as to get uh, the i in the end. And this makes sure that the verifier is convinced that the opener will have a, um, we ha will, will uh, be able to actually open the, the signature and know who the signer is. And so we also give a uh, proof uh, in the paper that this uh, description uh, is uh, correct under some conditions and that uh, the, this decryption uh, terminates um, because there, there we, so we sample this uh, challenge C prime and we have to make sure that there exists um, enough C primes um, so this decryption can uh, go through. Uh, okay, so now there's uh, one open question on the slides. So it goes like this. So for the traceability reduction, we uh, need to add a uniformly random copy, so a uniformly random matrix B prime that has the same size as B to the public key. So the public key, instead of being just A, B, and U, it's going to be A, B, B prime, and U. And this uh, has quite a big cost in the signature. And now the, the thing is, um, this uh, B prime that we use seems to be an artifact of the proof. And uh, yeah, if we remove it, it doesn't seem to affect the security, but we need this B prime to uh, make the proof. So yeah, it would be uh, uh, an interesting question to find a uh, traceability proof for this group signature that doesn't rely on, on this uh, B prime to reduce the signature of the, the size of the signature. Okay, so uh, I guess this is it. Thanks for watching. Bye.